Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be here today. It's a long time since I was in Dublin, um, and it was a time when there was smoking in the bars, and I avoided all the music because of the smoke that billowed out with the lovely sound. So it's a lovely to see, to be back in Dublin now with that change. So I work at Seesaw in Oxfordshire, which is a charity that was founded in 2000, and it was really interesting seeing the child um, bereavement care pyramid, and what I'm hoping to do in my talk to you is show you how a service can actually fit in with your uh, model of ideal practice for bereavement throughout Ireland. So we believe that children benefit from bereavement support and our seesaw parachute here is used in our activity days to show children that they can still have some fun when they've been bereaved and to bring young people together. We do need child bereavement services. Um, Silverman's already been alluded to, that we live in the West with the paradox that we tend to protect children. We want to protect children from the reality of death and we don't talk about them. And there has been a trend to think, well, if we don't talk about it, it's not going to hit them. But as the Bobby story, that beautiful first introduction this morning showed, children will pick up on the things without anything being said and how much more frightening as it is that if that is not acknowledged and they're alone in this scared, bewildered world. And Smith referred to children as forgotten mourners, the children that aren't allowed to go to funerals. And when I've done training, I often ask people, have you been to a funeral below the age of 15? Do you mind if we do this now? Who here has been to a funeral below the age of 15? Okay, Be below the age of 10? Below the age of five? Okay, thank you. Who has been denied access to a funeral because of their age? Yeah, quite a few. And I think that's what we're doing. And you'll see outside, too, our book on um, children and funerals, what happens when somebody dies. And the idea of producing that resource was to help parents understand that it's okay for children to go to a funeral and to help prepare them. And disenfranchised grief is the concept Oka used, which is similar to marginalised mourners, people who aren't actually acknowledged in the grief process. And we do know that it can be horrific if children are excluded from understanding. And these two cases, the one on the left was a boy of eight whose grandfather and mother died from cancer, and he hanged himself. We don't know the story about how much he felt involved, but we can think that his world fell apart and he couldn't think of carrying on living. And the same is true of the boy on the right, whose mother was diagnosed with breast cancer um, sometime after his father died, and he killed himself a year later. The tragedy of that situation is the mum is still alive today and had thought it's best not to tell her son too much about what was going on. So at Cecil, we believe we're sharing a grieving journey. We're not there as counsellors or experts parachuting in, and I think we very much fit with the ethos of your bereavement pyramid in that it is a journey where some people need differing levels of support. For some, it may be quite brief at the beginning. For some, it may be more prolonged. But we're sharing that journey, and we feel very privileged to be part of families trusting us with very difficult emotional times in their lives. We believe that working with bereaved children, we need to have an understanding of the background to this work. So I was very pleased to hear Elaine talking about some of the bereavement theories. The dual process model has lots of different pictures to describe it, and I think this is a very helpful model. Theories, in my mind, are ways of looking at, at people's experiences and putting them into a format that makes sense. And the dual process model helps people feel that they can have a really good day, they can have a really bad day, they may bounce back again. They may not feel they've moved on in this awful way, you meant to have this sequential journey. So it actually allows people to model reality. And it could mean that two years after the death, on the anniversary, you get shot back to thinking just as in the day of death, and it's okay to be like that, that's normal. And I very often draw that model out, both for teenagers and for adults, to actually say, you know what, you can go like this 10 times a day sometimes, and that's actually normal. And that can be really reassuring. And muddles and puddles and sunshine, this is just a concept of saying, I think it's dual process model for children, really, that you can have a child being told that granny's died and they may cry, then they dry their tears and say, can I go out and play now? So it's that normality of children can go from one process to another very quickly, and often because it's protecting themselves from the reality, they need to put their mind in another place. 
And it also explains when children go into a school after a death, sometimes the day after a parent has died, and teachers may be horrified. Actually, what that child is saying, home's really strange, I can't cope with this, school's going to be the same. So any teachers here, anybody supporting people, supporting children in schools, what they need in school is normality, recognition of what's happened, but normality, normal boundaries, normal structures. And this is another theory I think is very helpful. This comes from Linda Tonkin in New Zealand. And the previous model, perhaps, if you imagine the first picture on the left, the red sphere is, is grief, and the flask around it is the person. So it's saying in the first stages of grief, it's as if your whole body, your whole being is consumed by grief. There's nothing around the edges. And the thought was, over time, that grief will get smaller and smaller, so it won't have an impact. Now, in fact, people don't like that thought. If your mother has died, you don't want to think you won't think about her. You don't want to think it doesn't matter in the future. People want to hold on to the sense of who that person was, and that links in with continuing bonds as well. So if we think of the model, actually, yes, your grief's there. The fact that your mum has died is always going to be there. It's always going to be a form of sadness in your life. But your life around that can get bigger. More things can happen in your life. So it's a way of showing it's okay, your life will change, but you don't have to get rid of the grief. Um, and again, I draw that out, that figure out for, for teenagers and for adults, and it has a lot of meaning. And the other last theory I'm talking about is Warden, who uh, produced the idea of tasks of grieving. And this is very much at the, uh, on the groundwork of what we do. So accepting the reality of the loss processing the pain of grief, adjusting to a world without the deceased, and finding an enduring connection. And it's very interesting hearing Elaine speak, because actually, I think Elaine, wherever she is, I think these theories, again, fit in with that concept of how the internet, how um, the Facebook ideas actually assist in those processes. So that's something probably good to talk about later. So Seesaw, our story. We started in 1998 with research based on a trustee of Sobel House Hospice, Anne Kuldrick, who, going in to support adults in the community, felt that children were there as well, but were hushed out of the room and ignored. So she did some extensive consultation with um, parents and adults and children to see what needs were there, and came up with the uh, feeling that this was definitely a need for, for Oxfordshire. Cecil was established in 1999, um, and began with just a director and a practitioner, and the practitioner had two days a week allocated to supporting schools. So right from the start, we recognised that supporting schools would support children in a way we couldn't numerically do ourselves, and that support service runs now. We also felt that at that stage, on a very much on a shoestring, that we couldn't do all the face-to-face -face work ourselves, but that we didn't need specialists, we didn't need psychotherapists, psychologists, because the bulk of the work, as shown on the care pyramid, can be done by people who are sensible, informed, normal, everyday people. We don't want to pathologise grief. So we've retrained and recruited volunteer support workers. We've now uh, trained 50 people, 10 are currently working as support workers, and we're training about seven more at the moment. 2002, we had startup funding from Macmillan Cancer Care for the first ever pre-bereavement support worker in the UK. Um, Cathy, which I'll come on to, has done that work since that time. And in 2006, we responded to the needs of our families who said, you know what, we'd really like to meet some others who've gone through similar experiences. At this stage, Cecil looked into the work of Winston's Wish. Um, and felt they didn't want to follow the re residential group line, but to have day or activity days or half days um, as the model for, uh, for Seesaw. Just to put Oxfordshire into context for those who may have not travelled over to that part of the world, we're the Orange Blob. We're part of the Thames Valley, which covers Bucks and Barks as well. Um, population of 660,000 and an area of 1,000 square miles, which is a big county. We do a lot of travelling, and I'll explain how we work that later. Um, the John Radcliffe Teaching Hospital in Oxford is the main teaching hospital and is the centre for most of the resources, and we have three hospices in the county. Our aims are always that we provide our support rapidly, flexibly, and it's very much geared to the needs of the individual family. We don't have a set programme. You will enter our programme here, you will have this, this and this, and you'll come out the other end being OK. We let people dip in and out, we let people revisit grief, people can have as much or as little contact as they need. But also we are very rapid in responding. Um, I went out two weeks ago to a mother who uh, had just been told that she had 
recurrence of her breast cancer. She had a brain tumour. She needed an operation. She was having the operation the next day. She needed help in talking to the children. So I got the phone call at 11, and I was at her house at 1 o'clock that day. And when there's that sort of need, we do respond that quickly, which I think is... I'm very proud of that service. It's something I don't think other people can do. And when I was at Winston's Wish, that would never have happened. So I think it's a great service we can offer. Raising awareness of the needs of bereaved children is crucial. We still have people saying, oh, children will bounce back. They're resilient. They don't really understand. But we do know, yes, they're resilient with support. They can bounce back with support. But they do know what's going on. They do feel pain. They do feel grief. And because we don't have any statutory funding, um, we have to actually fundraise for ourselves for the majority of our work. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. But we do believe we offer a very cost-effective service that's um, the envy of some of the statutory services. So how do we help? We provide children up to the age of 18 when a parent or sibling has died and also when a parent or sibling is dying. We sometimes get calls when someone has had the initial diagnosis of cancer. Um, but we know now cancer is a very different story than it was 10, 15, even five years ago, where that from that initial diagnosis, many, many people can have a long life. What we don't want to do is if a mum gets a mammogram, I've got cancer, oh my God, I'm going to die, being transmitted to her children when she may be absolutely fine and, and be cured. So we advise on appropriate level of information at a different stage, so we're not actually deluging a child with too much information too soon. Our school support service is vital. We get calls from, parent, from teachers when a, a parent has died, when there's been a pupil suicide, when a member of staff has died, when a child has died in a road traffic collision. And again, phone call will be there that day. Very often, Chris, our schools worker, will be out that day or will be speaking to schools before school the next morning. And our uh, activity programme is varied during the year. And we work very closely with this list of, of professionals working in children and young people services. Recently, we had a meeting with Thames Valley Police because uh, a 10-year-old was being uh, interviewed, having witnessed the death of his friend in a road traffic collision. And he was interviewed without any other adult present. This poor little lad, who in any case thought, if only I'd hold on to his hand, it'd have been fine, was then being interviewed by the police. Of course, increasing his sense, it's my fault, I'm in trouble. That's what children think. So we've actually got another process in place now so that police are dealing with things in a rather different way that protects the children. We have no waiting list for our time. Um, it's a rapid response. And we do this, I think, because we have a very good support um, system from our support workers. We don't charge for any of our services. And we're available anywhere in Oxfordshire, regardless of, of race, colour, gender, ethnicity. And whatever the cause of death, many charities in the UK are based on hospices. And they work almost exclusively with uh, families bereaved through the death of somebody who's been through their hospice service. So if someone's died in a road traffic collision, was being murdered or has died through suicide, there isn't an obvious person to go to or resource to go to. So we actually provide support from any cause of death. And we do have people coming back to us. Um, I think this has been alluded to earlier. If a child is bereaved by suicide at the age of six, the age of 13, they may have many more questions. And they also may be thinking about their own mental health and will I do this too and what are my options? So there's not a failure of our service or the individual if they need to come back to us. It's actually a sign of, yep, their de de development's changed and this will be helpful. We have quite a small team, four at the top of the clinical team, um, two full-time, two four days a week, and then we have an admin team with fundraising, community fundraising, finance and trusts. And we have 10 very committed trustees who bring a wide range of experience, and we have volunteers working in lots of capacities. The service costs 300,000 a year, and if you remember back to the population of 660,000, it occurred to me that that costs the people of Oxfordshire two pounds per person per year. Um, so I think we should just put that figure out and then sack our fundraiser. <laughs> We'd have all the money we needed. Most of the money comes from our own fundraising. 35,000 from Oxford Clinical Commissioning Group, which is, um, was the old PCT Primary Care Trust. Um, we're hoping we've got another three years funding from them. And the hospice gives us 20,000 to reflect a contribution to their pre-bereavement work. These are the areas that we use for fundraising, and we believe it needs a broad base. You can't just rely on any one of these elements. Um, trust applications have been very difficult in the last two or three years, and we've had a 
two-year budget deficit, which this year has just been pushed back into the positive budget. Um, so finances are very important, and without actually the support there, we wouldn't actually be funding. So our referral process, when a parent or sibling is dying, it's often too difficult for a parent to get in touch directly, but the link that Cathy has with the hospices is such that they will explain the seesaw service, and then Cathy will make contact with the family and then support them. Um, after death, we look as much as possible for families to, um, to decide to call us, because sometimes people are told, oh, you must call Seesaw, and they think, why? And they don't really know. So we want people to actually choose the right time for them to get support and not to feel pushed into it. But there are times when families are so distressed that someone calls on their behalf, in which case we say, OK, well, you make the call again when you're with that person, and then pass the person over to me. So someone's actually made that initial contact. Because picking a phone up is such a hard thing to do, not knowing what response you get. Um, so we try our best to facilitate that initial conversation. We've now supported over 3,500 children um, in Oxfordshire and have worked in 80% of Oxfordshire schools. And I think we've got a, quite a pioneering service in terms of pre-bereavement on our schools project. And at the back there you will see there is a, a schools pack um, which is available for download on our website as well as a, a pack for helping um, children with learning difficulties who have been bereaved. And a key part of this, I think, is um, partnerships we have in Oxfordshire. Hospice Charity and um, OCCG have mentioned Oxford has a, Oxfordshire has a bereavement alliance, so all the people concerned with bereavement at any level, be it crews, Samaritans, different faith organisations, we all know about each other, so we can signpost and refer. That would include SANS, a neonatal death, SOBS, bereavement through suicide, SAMS, bereavement for murder and manslaughter. And those are all bodies that can be accessed from Ireland as well because they have national helplines, so look at some of those sites. The Suicide Prevention Intervention Network was set up for Thames Valley in about the last 18 months on the back of the National Suicide Prevention Strategy developed by Manchester University for last year, for 2013. And the key thing here is saying that when there's been a suicide death, the bereavement following suicide is first of all very, very difficult, but also there are ramifications in terms of others who know that person, whether in the family, the school, clubs, wider community. So the feeling now and the buzzword in this field is postvention is suicide prevention for the next generation. So postvention being a new word. So postvention, in other words, suicide bereavement support is prevention for the next generation or people around. So this suicide prevention intervention network, we're um, working in Oxfordshire um, to actually set up a rapid response to need, and I'll show you how that fits in with our rapid response team for John Radcliffe. The John Radcliffe, um, for any child under 18, any death of a child under 18, has a multidisciplinary team meeting within 48 hours of that death. And all interested professional parties are invited to that. Seesaw is one of those. Um, so school head teachers, social workers, health visitors, anybody surrounding the death of that young person will come together. And the key point of that is identifying need for bereavement support. So we're trying to actually model that for suicide of a parent as well, so that if there's been a parental suicide death, there is a rapid response meeting to actually deal with this. And that will be reviewed in the child death overview panel each year as well. So in thinking about how Seesaw offers its services, when I looked at this care pyramid and then started thinking what I did, what I'm hoping you'll believe is that um, you've now got your care pyramid, which I think is a fantastic piece of work, so congratulations to all involved with that. I think we fit into this rather well, so hopefully you'll come away thinking this can work for us. So we do believe that there are tiers of support, that not everybody needs the full range of support. Um, we have questions, we have calls that may just be wrapped up in one call or one visit to our office or one visit to home, and that's enough just to know that people can then come back to us. And a lot of our work is about normalising what's happening, saying, yes, of course, your child will be crying, will be upset, to realise and understand what child bereavement means. Um, but we do recognise that there are a great variety of needs over time and some needs will be very complex. In terms of the support we offer, telephone, telephone support in office hours is our first level and our school support service I think actually um, helps enormously in terms of containing grief and normalising a child's work and time in school as well as providing support for professionals who may do one-to-one -one work. 
Um, our school support involves a pack as well, and we can advise and give training. Um, we currently don't charge for any training, but we're actually going to have a, a scheme of offering some specific modules to deal with different areas of work with different ages and stages, so that we can actually skill up um, teachers even more. A website has just been set up, so please do look at that. It's going to have more added to it, but the idea is it's a starting point for information sharing and signposting to other areas. Um, our support is community-based, and Nicola said that you're looking for something that is a community-based level two support service, and I think that's what we do. We have uh, our support workers who are people who come from a variety of backgrounds, often social work and teaching and nursing, um, who go through our training program and following an assessment visit by one of the four clinical members of staff, the support worker will be the person who does the majority of the one to work. Um, and that happens in the home, out of school hours, so children not being more isolated by being taken out for a counselling session from their class. It's very discreet, it's very subtle, uh, and it's very much in the home, in the context of the family as well. So those of you who've worked in homes, you'll know how much information you get from a home visit, don't you? You get such an idea of how they're coping, is the washing piled up, it may have always piled up, but you get a sense, are the pictures around of the person who's died, is the family pet eating out of the child's food, all sorts of things that you understand, but we have to go in non-judgmentally. And one of the key things with our support workers is saying, you know what, there may be places you go, you really don't want a cup of tea, and your feet may stick to the floor. I'm sure a lot of you have been in that situation. But we've got to be there, whatever, um, and not appear as a lady bountiful, come in uh, and um, be someone like their normal social worker. We've got to be there as a, as a companion. And the side-by-side -side program, again, operates at community level in lots of different areas. And we find, because we're well-known now, we get people like the Cotswold Wildlife Park will say, do you want to bring a group of children to the day? We get free tickets for a circus. We get pantomime tickets. So people know we're around. So we get a lot of goodwill, um, gifts in kind, really, that help develop these experiences. At level three, uh, if we have children who have more complex needs, we will tend to see that as a member of the staff team. I, I particularly see families bereaved through suicide, um, but we do have more traumatically bereaved children who we will assess the level of need. But because we've got that additional professional academic skill, we then do recognise when we have worrying symptoms that need um, ongoing referral to a, a level four. And we have very good relationship with the child and adolescent mental health teams. So sometimes we, we never see people at the same time, but we may do some bereavement work in the context of the whole of the CAMS team, or the CAMS team may be supported by us to deliver the pre-bereavement work. So that way we have a very good tied up system. The competencies, I think, are very important, and I would say that our VSWs do hit the level two. Um, our clinical staff are certainly working at level three. Um, some of us have more towards the level four, but that's informing our referral process. It's not situations we would take on. So if we knew there was a, a real um, a risk of, uh, of suicide, then we would actually be able to refer to CAMS directly and they take our recommendations very seriously. So we have those competencies, but we know we've got a very good structure of, of passing on information, particularly so that our social workers who work alone in the home don't feel exposed. They're all safeguarding training, they all have my personal mobile number, so they may work out of hours in the evening into the early evening, but if they're worried, they know they can get me straight away and I think that's really important if you've got that community level of working. Telephone support is hugely important and as a small team we can always be almost always re uh, rely on the fact that when a family is known by one member of staff they can keep on that contact with a member of staff because what people don't want to do is repeat the story again and again and start from scratch and this used to hit me when I was a GP thinking I lived in the years of general practice when you actually knew your patients over a period of time. I'm now in an era where I never know who my GP is. And you, you do feel that sense of, oh, I've got to start again. Why can't we just carry on from where we are? So at Seesaw, any family who is relying on telephone support will say, can I speak to Helen? Can I speak to Chris? And if we're not there that day, they know they'll have that continuity. Um, school support service, I won't run through this completely. You can read it at leisure when you get the... the um, PowerPoint, but it's a very varied service. Um, 
when Chris is away, I go into the schools. And if I can just give you one example that sums up the support. We had a call, um, I was at a rapid response meeting at the John Radcliffe on the Monday. They said, there's a boy who's jumped off a building. Um, he's going to be turned off life support later this day. To told of the two schools, his sister's school, his school. Um, you may get a call from the school. Four o'clock, I got a call from the school, um, the school he'd been at, and he'd, he'd died. He hadn't died, sorry, at that stage. I said, I'll come into the school in the morning. So I was at the school at 8.30 in the morning and <clears throat> was in the hall where all these year nine pupils were coming in because they'd heard he was ill. While I was in the hall, um, the very first mobile phone message came through say this boy had died. So I was in a, in a building with 120 14-year-olds who were hearing on, on their mobile phone and on Facebook that their, their friend had died. Um, so it was an extraordinary experience, um, thinking, how do you manage these children in the school? So we were there to support that. They started straight away posting things. We got some cards made. They were writing messages on a tree. And it was <clears throat> incredibly moving. Um, being amongst young people who sat in little supportive clusters. So I think I would defer to Elaine and say, actually, the Facebook thing can be quite good, because they were there supporting each other. <clears throat> and, and there were tears. One boy picks up a guitar. He was just playing the guitar in the corner. So it was a very moving, connected experience. But the children, the young people, were also using Facebook with others outside that school at the time. So we were there for that. We went to the school of his sister. Um, the sister called in. She's someone I'm giving ongoing support to after the suicide and the parents. We've been into the schools. We've actually done some sessions with staff about looking for mental health issues. So we've probably spent 40 hours maybe around that sort of time, but very much at the time it was most needed. And I think that's, that's very, very important. Pre-bereavement work, this is Cathy, um, Do Good, she works with Do Good. We've got the very first therapeutically trained bereavement Labrador. Um, <laughs> Do Good is 12, he's just had a knee replacement and he's getting on a little bit. Um, but he's a really good tool for Cathy, he's such a gorgeous dog. He's really rock solid, he's very empathic. And if a child's crying, he knows, and he just puts his head on the lap. And what it allows is... Kathy goes to, the, to walk with the dog. They put him on a lead. He does some tricks with not eating treats when he should and shouldn't. Um, and is a real icebreaker with children. And if you've ever seen children with dogs, you know, you know that they just get that unconditional warmth and, and sense of being okay. Um, so he's been a great dog. And we're uh, currently training a dog called Cindy, who, um, well, she's one big wag, really, so I think she's going to be a little more uh, difficult to work with. But it's been a really helpful um, process. Not saying everybody in pre bereavement has to go out and get a Labrador, but it's, it's certainly worked for us. Um, side by side, we work in a lot of different ways. Um, sorry, suicide bereavement. Um, my experience of suicide bereavement is that it is a, a uniquely difficult death. There are so many issues around. And I think in the early stages, you've got the language around the death and how it happened so children do hear honestly and I think this is where we actually encourage honesty quickly and openly because this is where I think there are damaging effects on the internet someone can be found dead and very quickly there are conjectures going out oh he was taking drugs or he did this or did that so for children to have an honest open account from the start is important but I think the thing about a suicide death is very often you actually have to manage the anger and all the very conflicting issues around it before you can even cope with bereavement so maybe something David might go on to later in his talk this afternoon, that there is a trauma element to a bereavement death in addition to the bereavement issues of loss and maybe a very conflicting relationship. And we encourage people to tell the truth in the beginning, but I've recently worked with a family and the mother was absolutely adamant that the children shouldn't know the father died through suicide because she wanted them to grieve for him before they felt angry about it. And we advised very strongly against it. Um, but she absolutely insisted. And a year on, um, she agreed or she felt it was time to actually say to her 13 and 10-year-old how the father had died. Couldn't face doing that herself, so she knew it was going to happen. I'd had sessions individually with the children about bereavement. And we sat down in the sitting room and she just launched in and, and did a really good job of saying what had happened. I had to say hardly anything, which is the ideal, but I was just there to mop up if necessary and to have any questions, just to feel that security blanket by her, really. So it actually enabled her to tell the story. Our support workers, um, great people, um, very skilled. Uh, 
They train over 10 weekly three-hour sessions after being recruited through people tending to have heard about us actually and said, you know, we'd like to be involved. They have a learning journal which they reflect upon the impact of their talk. We do very carefully consider people who've had recent bereavements because you may find in your working environments some people come into working bereavement on their own agenda and they may be too intimately involved in their own grief or they may be too wrapped up in their own process that they can't actually give to other people. So we're very careful who we choose. We ask people to do a creative project, we review them halfway through and have a final interview. And some people decide, actually, no, it's brought up too much for me and I can't carry on, and of course we respect that. But most people are very committed and, and go on to the whole training. And they all have a monthly peer group supervision. We feel this is absolutely essential. Um, we talked earlier about looking after ourselves. I'm sure you've all been in a situation where you meet a family and somehow something just gets under your skin and it's devastating. And all of us, I think, at Seesaw, everyone I've ever worked with in this field, has situations when they just feel overwhelmed. And it's important that that, that is managed in some way. Um, they also have ongoing training, so we bring in different resources, different ideas, and that's a wonderful Saturday year. The programme, this summarises what we do over the numbers of weeks. Um, we do believe that bereavement theories are essential for anything else and are the foundation for other activities and suggestions. Some people have come with some counselling skills. Some people have come with a counselling training and psychotherapy training. And to some extent, there's a bit of unlearning that needs to happen there because they're not there. As, we don't call ourselves counsellors. We're alongside people, so it's a different. It's not a directed in the same sort of way. We consider what it's like going into a home for the first time and starting to build up a relationship and also when it's the right time to finish. And if you've worked with a family long term, we, I well, speak for myself, when I've worked for a family long term, I feel very personally invested in that family. And when it comes to an ending, it's about me as well. It's about me thinking, actually, I'd really like this family. I'd like to know how they're getting on. So we have to actually be very careful that we don't um, create dependency. But we're actually creating that separation and resilience. So they can get in touch occasionally. But actually, it's a good sign if the teenager says, you know what, I don't see Helen this week. I think I'm OK. Um, so it takes robustness on our side to see that not as a rejection, but as actually a sign of success. Um, we do creative ways of working. Now, I worked as a primary school teacher for quite a few years, um, and I love doing art, and I love doing music for music therapy, and I've, I love the term um, digital immigrant. So I'm a digital immigrant, but I'm really becoming very well natified, I think. Um, what things I've been doing, I've been using iPad. Um, I take my iPad with me. Um, I've helped children create little iMovies. Um, I've worked on a family's computer, so thinking of a memory book, one girl, her brother was bereaved, she was bereaved through suicide, and she had lots of pictures, just didn't know what to do with them. He was very into his music. So we sat at her computer, we loaded all the pictures, and then we actually made it into an iMovie with his favourite tracks. And it was burned as a DVD, and she could send the DVD to family members. So it was a very contemporary way of working. I don't think kids these days want to have paper in scrapbooks, and as Elaine pointed out, they probably don't have still photographs. But I think making something um, of the images, so perhaps Facebook images, putting those together, putting together with music, is incredibly powerful. Um, and as a music therapist, I think adding music to anything can really enhance that emotional experience. So it's a really great way of, of working, and it has total ownership by the young people. Um, our support workers have been shown how to do it, and we're really worrying because they're very definitely um, in the pre-digital, uh, pre-computer era. Um, but I said, don't worry, if the kids have got an iPad, they just need the idea and, and they'll roll with it. But it's a lovely way of working. Um, so those are really our issues, and we do, through supervision, help them understand if they become aware of self-harming, if they become aware of very traumatic symptoms, then we do know about it and know we can refer on. Our side-by-side have great activities. Uh, I think it's more difficult for families these days to commit to weekend activities. I think they're so busy in the week, the thought of having two weeks intensive stuff on grief and bereavement is tricky. And certainly at Winston's Wish, um, only 20% of people um, actually go on a residential weekend. And we find that at Seesaw, even a day out at a weekend can seem quite a lot. It has to be an activity that really appeals. Um, but we do know they benefit, so we try and put in lots of creative things, of work, ways of working. We're about to have a youth forum, um, because on our website we'd like to have young people's views on what helps, what sites to go to, give their pointers, give their ideas. So to bring them together and help us design that activity. 
And we've had various things. We've had groups, if we have a cluster of grandparents who become carers on the death of their own child, we bring them together. Grandparents becoming carers is, is very, very hard. You know, if you're 70 and you've suddenly got an eight and a six year old to look after, chances are you don't know any other grandparents in that situation. So we try and bring people together who've got a shared experience. Equally, children who've been bereaved uh, at preschool age, this is for the parents, really, to know what it's like to get out and, and to meet other people who are understanding what they're going through. And we do have a lot of problem with children moving from primary to secondary school, and particularly on, amongst the boys. It's a very difficult time for them. And I don't know what happens in Ireland, but communication between primary and secondary school about bereavement is not very good. And I think there's a tendency in adults to think, well, you know, they were bereaved when they were seven, so it's not really relevant anymore. Um, so to actually have that awareness raising in schools, I think it's very, very important to know when a child has been bereaved and to be sensitive to triggers, to Mother's Day, Father's Day, events, anniversaries, going into adolescence without a dad to watch you play on the football team. All those things are really important. And I think if people understand what's behind uh, the issues in behaviour, then you can actually modify it much better than if you just think he's, he's really kicking off today. So I think, you know, for, for school's work, we're very much saying, actually, if a child is behaving badly, there's something underneath that. Let's look at what's underneath it, not just deal with the behaviour. We have an event for preparing for Christmas, and I see that the uh, Bereavement Network has a, a leaflet about that. The first Christmas is often a time that's incredibly difficult for parents. So we have a session in, in the beginning of December each year when people have been newly bereaved that year invited to come and just share, um, but almost to, to mark that time as a time of remembering, but then say, you know, it's okay, you can actually have some fun, you can still have Christmas, but to think about it. And we have various family events which are more rec recreational. In terms of group activities, we have um, a variety of ways of working depending on the children. So the idea is just to engage with the children at a level that appeals to them. And often that's through games, um, lots of resources around. If you ever look at um, Speechmark, who do the blog cards and trees you can see at the back, uh, they have a vast range of uh, resources for different elements of emotional literacy. And although they're not specifically bereavement related, it doesn't take much imagination to actually think, thinking about sharing feelings, thoughts, supporting each other. All those positive messages you can do in working with children and adolescents can be adapted for this work in bereavement. And under fives, um, a lot of people think that under fives don't really have a sense of, of grief. We know developmentally that the loss of the care, of the main caregiver, is a significant emotional thing. But what we do find is children need to have a sense of who their parent was. And at the, again, on my desk at the back, there's a photo memory book. And this was written in conjunction with a five-year-old whose father died of meningitis when his little brother was two and a half. He wouldn't talk about his dad at all. He just can't remember, can't remember. Um, but gradually, I'm just working with him. We work towards him drawing pictures about Daddy and talking a little bit, and then put together photographs with his mum, and they talked about the photographs. I wrote little notes down and compiled it into a photo book. So it used all this little words, all this little boy's words. Um, I have permission for that to be seen by people, by the way, from the family. Um, when Josh got the book, I remember sitting in the garden with him and his little brother and mum, and um, I said, here's your book, Josh. And he said, ho, oh. And he read through it all. I was six by then. And he read through all the words to his little brother. And then he finished it, he closed it up and said, you know what, I love that book. It's even better than my trampoline. So he really felt this sense of ownership of the book. And then I slightly rewrote it so it came out of his brother's words. So when his brother went to nursery for the first time, um, he actually brought his book about Daddy because it's, you know, when you start off kindergarten, well, tell me about your mummy or your daddy. He presented his kindergarten teacher with this book who we had prepared because it's, it's very poignant. Um, so that's a lovely resource to do. And I think we work a lot with, um, with games and stories and puppets. But under five, we're on the whole, we're actually working with parents to support the child. They don't need a professional other person in their lives. So it's more about uh, reporting at, uh, supporting at second hand. Grandparent care, as I've mentioned. Um, music, I think, is a, an incredible tool. Uh, it doesn't need to be a music therapist to do that. One way of engaging with teenagers, say, what are you listening to at the moment on your iPod or your MP3? And if you listen to what they're listening to, you get huge insight. They often don't think much about the lyrics, but the lyrics do come over very, very strongly. And if you go onto Spotify, you can put any song title and you get all the lyrics up. And it can really help you delve into, into what they're feeling. So that is a really good resource. 
in groups, we do things like drum circles, but it's mostly, I think, about thinking of emotions, thinking about music, putting playlists together, are a way of actually engaging a young person in something that doesn't involve just face-to-face -face conversation. And on the bottom left there, there's an, an ocean drum. Have you, anyone come across an ocean drum? It's, a, it's about this size. It's got steel ball bearings in it, and they rattle. And if you rattle them very hard, it sounds like waves. The brilliant way to silence a group of 14-year-olds, 10, 14-year-olds, is to say, right, I'm going to pass this drone around without a sound. See if you can pass it. I'm absolutely silent. Um, so it really focuses. Uh, but also, you can then pass it around and say, how, does, how do you feel about the fact your dad has died? So you get whooshy noises, or you get really rocketing noises. So it's just giving children another way of actually expressing this sort of deep insideness of, of what they're feeling in a way that doesn't need to be verbal. Um, we do a lot of writing. This little boy, um, he talked about a car accident. He was in with his grandparents. Um, heart attack. Um, and his words were, something attacked granddad's heart. We've heard that before, haven't we? Went bum, 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 and stopped. And I said, what's that below on his lip there? He said, oh, that's his tongue, all right? When people are dead, the tongue sticks out. So I'm not sure what he saw. But he drew this image of the car crash. He then talked about going to hospital, and mummy cried a lot. Um, and then he went on to describe Granny and Grandad going to heaven, and the clouds in heaven are smiling to see them. And again, they've got their tongues sticking out. This is his depiction of death. Telling the story it can be very difficult for children to tell the story of what's happened. Um, they don't want to say anything when they go into school. So sometimes it's a case of giving them a strap line, but thinking how far they can go at the moment. Is it difficult to talk about it at all, or is it okay? And we're looking not to accelerate people from the bottom of the ladder to the top, but to actually make a bit of progress with them. So I had one little chap who went to school, his father was killed, and uh, he wanted, went into school and said, I'm not going to tell them he's dead, I'm going to say he's gone into the army and he's not coming back. So they will make up alternative stories that then actually get them into deeper water. So helping a child say, OK, we know that daddy's died, so what are you going to say in school? And so you can get them then to say, OK, I can say that daddy's died and say, I don't want to talk about it anymore. So it's there, they've made that little beginning, and then they can decide who they can trust with further information. Um, I think working with things and objects with children is really important, because they don't really respond to a face-to-face -to -face on the whole. To be doing something side by side is really valuable. If you're working with somebody who's on the autistic spectrum when eye contact's an issue, side-by-side -side work, almost ignoring them and focusing instead together on something in front is a really helpful way of breaking through. Thinking about the pain of grief here, we've got people thinking of words that can actually reflect what's going on. The bottom right there is, is a workshop I did at um, the hospice in Hereford with a group of children on a big roll of wallpaper, great cheap resource, made a massive freeze of a sort of journey with volcanoes and all their feelings and words. They all felt connected with what was going on. And body mapping is helpful. Even very little children, you can actually talk about where are you feeling when you get angry, where do you feel it? Um, so you do, <coughs> you do get children talking about volcanoes in my tummy or my, my mouth goes very dry. The value of that is I then lead into relaxation exercise. And I think you can do relaxation with very young children. Um, there's a lovely CD called Meditation for Kids, which actually talks people through a meditation process. And children who have anxieties about going to sleep at night, leaving mummy, feeling frightened, feeling anxious, if you can actually train them to recognise their own bodily feelings and then to actually dissipate those feelings through re relaxation, then you've given them a life skill, really. So it's a, it's a very valuable process. But I wouldn't just stop with the body mapping. I'd go on to say, all right, let's think about how we can think about your fingers tingling and relax and talk up and down and think about breathing. So relaxation, meditation. Relaxation for kids is a, is a very good resource. Blob trees, again, a very good resource. This really helps you actually understand where people are, where they're feeling. And this example, uh, this is a little boy who did the photo book with me. And you can see from there, he described various people in various stages. So the bottom right, um, in, in the little red figure, that's Josh today feeling quite OK. Um, when he's right at the top of the tree, he feels happy. So it's a way of actually plotting where he is and who he is in relationship to friends. And he then wanted to draw the blog cards himself, so he collected a, a section of them that he thought were, were really talking about him. So heartbroken, scared, shouty, falling, having fun. This is talking about a life story before, after, 
um, for Turing and what happened. So letting children just freely express themselves through art, say what was life before, what's life like now, and what happened. But accept the fact the middle panel, they may not want to fill in. Sometimes they'll say, I don't want to do that bit. And that's fine, because at least you're knowing then it's something too enormous for them to process at that time. Lots of stories are useful. Um, the Day the Sea Went Out and Never Came Back, again, is a speech mark publication. A lovely story of loss and rebuilding life after loss that can work with 5 to 11-year-olds. Um, if you want a good list of books um, for reference, for reading, um, the Winston's Wish website has resources on there, which I've put together in the past. And also CBUK, Child Bereavement UK, um, has a very good section on suggested reading for different ages and different situations. Puppets are great fun. Um, puppetsbypost.com has the most tempting range of puppets you can imagine. Children will often speak through a puppet or to a puppet or have a puppet in front of their face um, to actually express themselves. Or we'll have a dialogue. The little boy with the two puppets there, he was the child who drew the picture of the car crash and the, car, the attack. And on the left is, is him and on the right is his granddad. And he engaged in a total sort of two-way conversation between the two of them. I think I've covered those in terms of Warden's, cost, uh, warden's Tasks, Just Into World Without the Deceased, looking at the strategies. Have you all come across Memory Stones? Some nods? Memory Stones, a very simple resource. Rough rock represents difficult memories. A smooth stone is ordinary everyday memories, and gemstones are great memories. And what you can do with these is you, you actually get a child to describe something difficult, which could be the death. What's every day about what's happened with your family? Well, we used to go to school every day and I chatted to Dad in the car. What was a gemstone? Oh, when we went on holiday. And you can actually then say to them, you can hold all those memories in your hand at the same time. You can feel the tight stone gripping in, but you've still got those other memories. And it can be a lovely way of finishing off a session. It's saying, OK, let's think about what's going to be difficult in the next week. What's going to be OK? What are you really looking forward to? And you can get these little bags for party favours or weddings, um, pebbles off the beach, uh, little rough stones, and you can go to gemstone people to get these others. And children love choosing them. They really choose very carefully. And in training sessions with adults, it's surprising how long it takes the gemstones to go around because people are fingering each one and seeing which really means something to them. This is uh, Josh's picture of his daddy. And then thinking of memories, memory books, again, I'm saying using more into the IT side of things, creating DVDs, iMovies, uh, slideshows, and using life stories. Uh, one family, they wanted to know more about their granddad, so they had an iPad, and they started interviewing their granny about them, and a very interview process that was then filmed and recorded for them forever. Mem <coughs> memory jars, again, a nice way of working with memories. This can be done as a whole family activity. Um, and if you need to look about how to do that, again, if you go to the Winston's Wish website, there'll be um, a sheet on actually how to use memory jars with the family. So I think I'm coming towards the end. See, so our future. We believe in evaluation, our, evaluating our service. And you may be aware that the Childhood Bereavement Network has um, devised and piloted uh, childhood bereavement evaluation tool which should be available any time now. This is actually showing um, an analysis of where a child is at the start of the process and where they are at the end, hopefully to show a shift emotionally in all their coping. And we're going to actually run that so when our support workers go in on the second visit, having made a relationship in the first, they will then go through this questionnaire. But, but using it as a therapeutic tool, not a market research, do you like scrambled eggs a little bit, a lot, not at all, but actually using all those questions, say, how are you getting on at school? Really well, not very well? And then using it to actually build up their understanding of that child, young person. They will finish that at the end as well, and hopefully it'll show job satisfaction to the BSWs, but also a real sense to the family that there's been that sort of shift. We want to maintain our service to families. We're hoping we'll be going on for another 15 years. And we want to be sustainable, so our fundraising is, is a key element to it. But we're increasingly aware that we need to be very evidence-based uh, because that's the way we'll get funding from trusts and from statutory bodies. And we want to actually increase our outreach to uh, ethnic communities. We don't have a huge ethnic population in, in Oxfordshire, but we are aware of Muslim families who struggle. Uh, if you work with any Muslim families, you'll know that for the majority, two weeks after death is the time of mourning, and then the person isn't mentioned again. And that's very, very hard. We've had several Pakistani women who don't speak English who have been very isolated because they're not supported by the imams because it's the men who went there. So we've got these second-generation children who are really struggling between this mix between Muslim UK 
um, and thinking about what's happened there. So we are working with different faith organisations and we're hoping that the um, what happens when someone dies will come out with a version for Judaism, Islam, Sikhism and Hinduism. So we're actually reflecting the, the ethnic connections of other people. And we want to contribute to best practice at national level. One or two people have said that they like our school's download, um, they'd like to be affiliated or connected with us in some way, and I think if we can all share what information we have, it's a great thing. That's the whole point of a network. And although we are technically another country, I think Ireland counts as sort of with us. Um, and I'm very, very happy from any of you, if you want to pick up a card to me, email me, if you want any of this information, any ideas on supporting sport workers, how to train them, any of the resources, really, please feel free to get in touch because I'm very, very happy to share those with you. And we'll look forward to, to future contact. So it just sounds to say, very best of luck, everybody. I think there's a lot of passion um, about providing child bereavement support services and I think with that passion and with this excellent model and framework here uh, you're going to do great work for children in Ireland. Thank you very much.